Welcome to The Criminologist, the podcast dedicated to educating and entertaining our listeners. We bring you subject matter experts from around the world and share the latest and greatest evidence-based practices and interventions to help individuals desist from a life of crime and delinquency. Now, please welcome the host of The Criminologist, Joseph Arvidsson. Hello and welcome to episode 129 of The Criminologist Podcast. Happy to have you all with us today. Nice to be back in the home studio after being overseas for a bit. Welcome to those new listeners I may have picked up while making great connections in Europe. And if you are new to the show, allow me to give you some insight as to what we are all about. We love exploring and examining new theories around criminology and corrections and, of course, the topic of desistance from crime. We endeavor to bring you a nice blend of academics, practitioners, and of course, those with lived experiences to share. Which is why I am so excited to be bringing you my next guest. Portia Lauder is a writer and speaker and photographer and an advocate. She is the author of the book, Living Louder, A Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. It is her memoir and an account of compassion, faith, and enduring friendships discovered in federal prison. I am so glad to have connected with Portia. Her enthusiasm and passion come through clearly in this interview. Please enjoy my conversation with Portia Lauder, and I will see you all on the other side. Well, let's begin, Portia, by telling us a little bit about yourself and, generally speaking, a little bit about your journey, what that's been like. Thank you, Joe. Um, Yeah. So I, leading up to my my indictment, I guess you could say, I, I was a wedding photographer and was pretty successful at that. And then the real estate market came into play. And you know, at that point in time, I had young children and I was extremely busy as a photographer. And about 2008, when things just started going crazy, uh, the FBI showed up at my house and started investigating me. I remember just being terrified, you know, and I've had enough time now to look back on it and, and see what I could have done different. But I know for sure one thing that I could have done different is I could have just said, yes, this is what happened. Let's move forward and address it. And Um, but I was also struggling with an addiction. So my addiction started with prescription drugs. It really stayed with prescription drugs, but you know, I had some sobriety and then I really had relapsed. And during that time when the FBI was coming around, wasn't the best time for me to try to, to address the addiction either. And so, um, was trying to manage the stress with that. And, uh, at that point in time, I was under pretrial supervision. So I was indicted and I, you know, I was really fortunate, I guess, because I was white collar. They let me just go to the federal courthouse and they fingerprinted me there. And I met my probation officer, my pretrial officer at that point in time. Uh, I had a really good pretrial officer and, a, and I've had a really good probation officer. I had uh, a couple, I told my probation officer that I was struggling or my pretrial officer that I was struggling with addiction. So we, he was aware of that. We talked about it and I was drug testing. There were some prescriptions that I was allowed to to stay on as I was trying to, you know, get myself in a healthier place. Also, I had some problems with my attorney and I, I kind of had an open door policy with my probation officer. So I'm super grateful for that. One experience I remember was that he showed up at my house and my I was having a really hard morning and I was like, I can't see you today. He said, let me come in and help you. I was like, what? <laughs> so he came in and he made pancakes for my youngest daughter. <laughs> He's like, let me just help you out. And then he sat down and he goes, what can I do to help you get in a better place? He's like, because you've got some tough stuff coming up. So yeah, wow. I had like, you know, the best experience. So shout out to Utah probation. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, I really struggled with, I guess, you know, owning the fact that I was going to have to go to prison. 
I was white collar. I hadn't been justice involved up to that point. And so I just couldn't see how I was going to be able to go to prison and have a life after that. It's like, right. I'll have a criminal record. How am I going to even, what does my fu- future look like if I'm, if I'm a felon and I'm a mother and I'm married and, you know, and we're talking a lot of prison time. My range was zero to seven years. So 84 months was the max. And I had uh, been so disagreeable and really drug things out, made it hard enough that by the time I walked in the courtroom, I pretty much knew I'm facing the maximum sentence and I probably deserve it, you know, mm-hmm. just by the way I'd acted. So, um, so anyway, that, that happened. I walked into the courtroom. I was sentenced to 84 months. Um, and I had, I was able to spend eight weeks saying goodbye to my children. My judge designated me to the California, Dublin, California. It was the closest prison to Utah, federal prison. And when I got to Dublin, it was a complete shock to my system. Devastating to walk in. I left, you know, three young children at home with my husband. I mean, they were seven. So I'm sentenced to seven years and I have a seven-year-old daughter. So I'm just trying to get my arms around that. And then I have a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. So really hard ages to to lose their mom. And then we don't live in a community where, you know, other kids have parents that are incarcerated. So it was different for my kids to, that, that was difficult for them. So I actually went out, I reached out to the, to the principal of our school and said, please support my kids. Like if there are therapists or anyone that can talk to my kids, I'm going to be gone for a little stretch. And I, any support that you can give to my kids in the process that has been really beneficial because I was open about it. I even reached out on social media to all my friends, everyone, and just said, this happened. I was sentenced to this length of time. My family's going to need you. They're not guilty. I am. So please support my family. I need to back up. I need to back up a little bit when you said shout out to Utah probation. I was uh, sadly blown away at the uh, that, that <laughs> approach that your probation officer took which speaks to we always train around the importance of what we refer to as the working alliance and that your probation officer can have all sorts of other skills, but if they don't make that connection with the client and again, have what we refer to as that working alliance to degree, it's really all for naught, but it sounds like you had the probation officer who really embraced that and realized I can do these other approaches. But at the end of the day, if Portia doesn't think I'm in her corner, it's just not going to work. And by coming in and making pancakes and all those things, <laughs> yeah, that was the working alliance on steroids. But that must have resonated with you as well then. Yeah, I really trusted him. Um, I trusted him to the point that when when I was having a difficult time with my attorney, um, there were some inappropriate things happening. And he was the one that I went to and said, I need help. You know, what should I do? And he, he helped me. We got it worked out together. And so like, I trusted him. I knew I could tell him what was going on and he wasn't like, we were in it. I mean, he, 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 yeah, he was in my corner, so to speak. Like there was nothing he could do. I got the sentence I got, but I knew that he was there to support me and help me the best way he could. Yeah. And that trust is so lacking. I train probation officers on what we refer to as core correctional skills or evidence-based practices, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if you're, if your client doesn't trust you, which I know a lot of them don't, again, this is kind of all for naught. They've got to have that trust. I was recently had the privilege. I know we spoke offline about this, but I just returned from a trip um, to Europe where I was training at the international training school on core correctional skills and I love it because I learned from all these other jurisdictions, the approaches they take. And at one point we were talking about – related to this, but about how even reporting to the probation office, the glass and steel and the big desk, there's there's that implied power differential between the probation officer and the client. So what jurisdictions in Europe are experimenting with is what they call walking probation, just – okay. Meet me at the park, and we'll just take a walk around the park and discuss everything that we would do in my office between me and you and this big steel desk where my chair rises above your chair and it's clear that I'm the boss. But it really helps humanize that relationship and, and again, establish, like you said, that that trust and that that working alliance. So thank you for uh, inspiring me with that. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like I've um, I've just been really fortunate. I there's some 
things in the middle we'll talk about, but I'll tell you, even when I got back, so when I came home from prison, I had a new uh, probation officer. So I was initially in BOP custody at the halfway house. My custody, I hadn't even gone into probation yet. And the probation officer showed up at the halfway house, said that he would like to meet me, sit down with me and my caseworker and ask me what my plan was and how he could help support me go into probation. I was like, really, you want to meet me, <laughs> you know? And, and then my, my caseworker for the BOP was suggesting that I take a job I didn't really want to take because it would pay more money. I was like, I really want to work in a way that brings meaning into my life. And my probation officer said, you know, Portia, I would definitely suggest working with the BOP. But when you come into probation, we can talk about that. And we can find a way to help you do things that are meaningful, but you're also going to have to, you know, we'll work together. So it's just that trust thing right away. Like, I just feel like I've had the very best when it comes to probation. When I train a lot of times, I'll tell probation officers, even the importance of the language we we use that probation uses. And I heard you reference a, a little bit there when you stated that your probation officer said, okay, what are we going to do? What's the plan that we are going to do? Again, this collaboration versus how am I going to fix you? Cause you're broken. Right. Yeah, yeah. I have not felt that way. And I was broken, <laughs> right. you know, but I didn't feel that way. I felt like, like empowered working yeah. with probation. I felt empowered. So, so let's fast forward to Wasika where, you were incarcerated, but also took advantage of your situation and became involved as a leader in a, and, and a guide in residential treatment programming, focusing on things like conflict resolution and assertive communication, life skills coaching. Talk about that experience. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not going to say I did four and a half years total in prison. I'm not going to say like right out the gate. I was, you know, I was in the best place mentally. It took me a few years. Uh, I started the RDAP program. I think I had been incarcerated for two years. And about that time, I was really hungry to learn. I, I knew that, you know, I want to go home with something. I mean, I, I started seeing the time I had in prison almost like, like a college degree. It's like, I've got four years. What am I going to do with it? What am I going to leave with? And I had a, a class with a gal that, that was so beneficial for me. She, she stood up in the front of the room and she said, uh, I'd like to share this assignment. And then she took like 15 minutes. There were 70 of us in the room and she like made a list of everything she had ever done to hurt anyone. And it was like full accountability. It was hardcore stuff to hear. I was like, are you kidding me? We're all just sitting there in chalk. And she's like, I did this to my kids. I did this to my husband. I did this to my community. I lied to my neighbor. I, you know, just line by line. And we all just sat there in silence. And there was so much power in the room. And the therapist looked at her and, she, and the therapist said, I just have one question. What would make you care so much about your recovery that you would stand here and be so honest today? And she said, I have tried everything to change my life. And I have decided that I'm going to be honest or I'm going to die. Like, I can't do this anymore. And so when I saw that, I knew that was my path to freedom because I could see the power that came into, you know, just in the room. And so as I started, when I went into treatment, the ARDAP program, I, I made a list, an inventory of everything I could see that I had done to hurt anyone. I also reached out to my kids and said, I'm a hundred percent responsible for where I'm at today. It is not the government, my length of sentence. Nobody did me dirty. I did myself dirty and I hurt you too. And I want you to write me letters telling me how I hurt you. And so I went into the program with a lot of strength because I had owned that. And the therapist there could see that I had a genuine desire to improve my life. And so right out the gate, they, they made me a leader in the program. And first they started as a mentor. Then they had me teaching classes. I already worked in the reentry program. So I was connecting with the women on the compound, teaching them to write resumes. Just, I could see pretty early on that to, the only way I was going to get through my prison time was to find some meaning. And so, you know, serving others, but I learned things I had waited my whole life to learn when I was in RDAP. And I, I would suggest I wish that everyone had that treatment available to them. I got it because I have substance abuse problems, but it's not just a, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's things that changed my life to hold myself accountable, hold other people accountable, setting boundaries, 
And I loved it. And so they just said, hey, we want your support. They had me working in the community as a leader because the therapists aren't always there. And so I, I loved that role and uh, it has guided me, you know, even as I've, I've come back into the community, I work in that capacity as well. So we love acronyms in government. I know that um, remind us what RDAP stands for. Yeah. Residential drug and alcohol program, I think is what it is. Okay. And you mentioned that it's cognitive based as well, which is close to my Yeah, heart. it's very little. I mean, the problem is to qualify, you have to have some form of addiction in order because you get a year off your sentence to do it. And so not everybody gets that program. But the truth is the program is very little about drugs and alcohol. It's more about those behaviors, the criminal thinking, the thinking errors and holding each other accountable. Yeah, 100 percent. That's why there's a huge push now in corrections, at least here in America, to really have all of our approaches cognitive based. And as you said, looking at those risky thoughts and, and linking them to our, to our behaviors and realizing, Hey, as you said earlier, the federal government's not in charge of my thoughts. The prosecutor's not in charge of my thoughts. I'm in charge of my thoughts. That's the good news. Right. And so therefore I get to change them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So you built on that experience when you segue to your work with renew wellness as a group facilitator. Yes. Yes. So when I got home, um, my, the BOP caseworker wanted me to go back to work as a photographer because it's a higher paying job, you know? And so I did that uh, for a few months and my own recovery was so important to me. Like one thing I figured out in prison was I care about myself. I love my kids and my husband, but I'm number one for me. Like I found that time and space to work on myself. And so coming home, it was like, I still need to put my recovery and myself as the most important because I have a purpose on this earth. And if I can't, if I'm focused on everyone else, then I lose myself, you know? So I, I had someone reach out and say, Hey, we would really love you. I was going to support group meetings anyway. And I, one of the owners of the treatment center was like, would you come work for us? And, and with the experience I had, I said, yeah, let me, let me do that. Well, by that time I was in probation. So I told my probation officer, I have this job opportunity and it's actually paying me a little less money, but it's so important for my recovery. He's like, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Take the job, you know? And, um, he told me that we would have to evaluate. I mean, if depending on the amount of hours that I was putting in, but, and I was drug testing and I was fine with that. And slowly I worked myself off drug testing because it's not probation that keeps me sober. It's me. that keeps me sober, right? Like I want to be sober (laughs) and he could see that. So he knew, but, um, so I, I have loved working at Renew. I work there now. Uh, I work everywhere (laughs) part-time because I'm passionate and I want to work everywhere. I was at another facility today. I initially, I worked there more hours. In fact, I was working swing shifts, grave shifts, and I was facilitating group meetings. And what was kind of special was that I also had all these experiences. I had been blogging and journaling while I was in prison. So, you know, I was able, I had a lot of content. And so I would work these evening shifts and I was able to organize all of that. And I, last year at this time, I published a book of those experiences sent it in to all the girls in prison. I got it on uh, the Securus tablet. So that's pretty exciting. I get to share that. I write to people in prison that are, you know, all over the country as well. So that's part of my recovery and giving back. But, um, and then I had people reach out and ask me if I would share my experiences. So I do some speaking and then I also go, uh, I work, I work at Renew. I do, I helped write a curriculum for, empowerment skills that is taught right now in Utah state prison. And then also I go into mental health facilities like with the youth and I, and I work with on those teaching those empowerment skills as well. So, and at Utah County, Utah, Bel- or, uh, Utah family therapy, I mentor a couple of nights a week as well. So. I love that approach that you don't paint yourself into a corner by working multiple part-time things rather than focusing just with one employer. As you were speaking, Portia, it reminded me of a concept in the desistance literature, which we love talking about desistance on the program, which is not so much about why folks enter into a life of crime and, and addiction and delinquency, but what that process exiting 
yeah. that trajectory looks like. And one of the more elusive things that the researchers, researchers have discovered is this concept, and I always struggle with this word, but it's this concept of generativity or giving back. So when they yeah. interviewed folks who have been 10, 20 years addiction and crime free, and they sort of map out their process, that's one of the common denominators that keeps popping up is it's not just getting sober, getting a job, getting away from your negative peers, sort of those traditional approaches, or even looking at the cognitive stuff they refer to. It's also, as you just outlined, it's this giving back that that was part of your process and that actually accelerated your, your, your trajectory. Yeah. I think that um, I, I had the time in prison to really take a look at my life. And one of the things that I noticed was that money was a problem for me. Like I was addicted to the hustle and making money long before I got into criminal, anything criminal, you know, real estate fraud was my charge. But before that happened, I, I liked to hustle. I liked to make money and I was on the go. And then I got into prison and I, I didn't miss money at all. Like the only thing I missed was connection with my family. You know, I didn't miss that. And so I, I was pretty determined when I came home to continue living a life of meaning. I found that in prison. I found real connection, sobriety, and meaning. And that was something that I didn't, you know, I found humanity there. And I was surprised because everything on TV says that people in prison are these crazy wild people. But I found connection, support. We, we really, I met a lot of amazing people that had the hardest lives that were, this was the safest they'd been in their entire life. Like this was actually where they were getting, they were more cared about in prison than they had had been throughout their life. Someone was showing up to make sure they were alive, which is, there were a lot of people in prison that they had such chaotic lives. Their parents had been incarcerated, families in addiction that they hadn't had been cared for. So my experience was that prison, I would never undo prison. I think prison saves lives. It allows people to grow up. Um, I had a lot of really good correctional officers that were supportive that helped me progress and move forward. I think there's still work to do, but I, I think that it's the most compassionate thing to allow people to get the healing that they, that they can, you know, incorporate into their lives and then, and then contribute. Let's hold your thought on work to do. We'll circle back to that. But before I forget, you mentioned it. Let's talk about promote the book that you wrote and tell everyone what that experience was like oh, about writing my book well in the book itself oh yeah well my yeah so um you know it's interesting i actually wrote while i was in prison i started writing after i was sentenced it was like my heart was just ugh. i just needed a place to to put words out there <laughs> i was gonna explode and so i started writing on social media and then i started a blog before i went to prison and i continued to write on it throughout my prison sentence and people followed that and then, when, you know, family and then community. And, and then when I got home, uh, I had people reach out and say, hey, why don't you write a book? Well, I, I was intimidated by that because it was more than just what I had been doing. But I found professionals that could help me. And, it, you know, I put my words out there and, and they were able to put it together. And, and so my book is called Living Louder, which my last name's Louder. <laughs> and, <laughs> it, and the subtitle is a compassionate journey through federal prison, because truly I feel like for me, it was compassionate. Like I feel like my life changed and the people that I met lives changed. And I, and I'm grateful for that journey. And so I, you know, a lot of people talk about the things that are wrong about prison, but I think there's a lot right that we can build on. And so I share that journey and it's, it's, it's on Amazon if someone's interested in finding it. It also is available, like I said, for a lot of the state prisons that have Securus tablets. They can The inmates can download it for free. It's available to the blind community and to the deaf community because there's an audio version and a print version. And really, it's just about sharing a different version of this experience. What I will do is I will find at least the Amazon link, Portia, and then I'll include that in the episode description of this program. So when folks yeah. are reading about what we talked about today, they'll just see that Amazon link right there and they can just click on that. Next follow-up question or backup question, is the are your blog posts still available for folks that would be curious about tracking those down as well? I have a website, PortiaLouder.com. I have... 
you know, one of the things that was hard for me because, and I probably sh- were reworking all of those blog posts, going back to the beginning of my incarceration, it, I offend myself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, it, but it's probably beneficial for someone to read and see that journey because I was just on fire, like going in, I was noticing what everyone else was doing wrong instead of looking inside myself. And so when I read it, I'm just like, oh, my goodness, girl, you just really are such a mess. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, and I imagine a lot of the spirit of those blog posts was captured in your book as well. Correct. Yeah, it's a lot more organized and easier to follow in my book. So, But to your point, I think I'm on 128, 129 episodes yeah. here. And when I listen to those early episodes, I just cringe myself. because <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a growth process, as we say. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, you've got a lot on your plate. You're doing all sorts of stuff. You mentioned some of them. You're also a board member with the Sobriety Foundation. And you've referenced the fact that you're a mentor with Utah Family Therapy, working with folks with intensive outpatient therapy. Again, leveraging your past experiences and giving back. Let's shift topics a little bit and draw again on your subject matter expertise. Um, What, you know, broadly speaking, what, what's working in our current approaches to, to reintegration and addiction and conversely, what's, what's not working so well? Yeah. From my perspective, you know, um, I really appreciated the, the RDAP program. I didn't think that I would as much as I did. You know, it's a lot more structured and stricter than regular prison when you get in that program. What I liked about it was not just that I, what I liked is that we were all happier. <laughs> like it's surprising to me to see people, how frustrated they are with the boundaries, but how much they, we all grew and how much more, we were able to connect with each other in the safer environment and the growth in having somebody care enough to tell you where you're struggling. Like, Hey, Portia, what I know, what I know about you is you struggle with, you know, honesty or whatever it is, you know, until that truth comes forward, it's really hard to work on it. And so I found the program to be really beneficial and I, I wish it was available to everyone in prison. Um, as far as, you know, I had some good and bad in terms of correctional officers approach. I had my, my initial, I had a correctional officer who had worked in corrections for 20 years right out the gate when I got into prison. She had been the, uh, the assistant warden and she was head over the education department. And I ended up being one of her secretaries or assistants and she could see that I cared. So she had me write curriculums and work with the women. But the thing that I knew was that she cared about my well-being. And she did that with really healthy boundaries. Again, for me, until I know someone cares, they really can't, I'm going to get nowhere with them, you know? So I I remember sitting down with her and I said, I don't know if I'm really that good at this job. And she said, you know what, Miss Slaughter, the most important thing is you, you, that you get healthy. She said, I want you to teach the program to the other women, but I want you to stay healthy. So if you need to leave to go make a call to your family, or if you need to go for a walk on the track, This job is for you to get healthy and help other people, but you're number one. You know, I knew she meant it. I knew that she cared. It made a huge difference. I had a correctional officer also at Wasika. The thing that I loved about the correctional officers that I worked with there was um, they were just no nonsense. One of the officers, I came in one day and he said, hey, Louder, my last name, Louder, why didn't you sign your pay sheet? And I said, I don't know. You know, I told him, I didn't, and he goes, don't make excuses. You're better than that. He goes, you're better than that. And I said, you're right. I just didn't want to do it. And I love that he cared enough and saw enough worth in me that he was like, come on, you're better than that. You know, he didn't like get mad at me. He's just like, don't make excuses, you know? And so to me, that's the right way to, to be able to see, you know, who I really am and what I'm capable of and also address the fact that I'm not living up to it and give me the chance to do it. You know? Yeah. It sounds like you are so blessed and fortunate to have really good caliber correctional staff members. We, we, we talked about the program, which as you noted, was rooted in, in cognitive behavioralism. And what I'm discovering Mm -hmm. at least is we need to strike that balance 
we've almost had this obsession about what works, what works. And, and I get that, mm-hmm. you know, for example, cognitive behavioral approaches work. That's right. part of it. But we also need to look at who works. Again, the, it's the, it, is the person empathetic or respectful or, I mean, we could train up every correctional officer in the top of the line cognitive behavioral interventions. But if they don't have, as you've talked about in this episode, that trust and that respect and that empathy. So the officer you just described to me, it's like, okay, that's who works. Like who understands how the change process works. The, yeah. the, the training on cognitive behavioral interventions is icing on the cake or, or symbiotic. But again, right. you, you have to have that person who understands how. You can't fake it. <laughs> you Correct. can't fake it. Correct. <laughs> and that's something, you know, if we had an officer once that he'd say, you're a bunch of degenerates. And there was another officer that she would say, your mother didn't raise you right, you know. And you just knew neither one of them could see any value in you. And there's no way. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if they tried to do some cognitive behavioral therapy for me. I would just gone, yeah, you don't care about me. You see no worth in me. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I have learned even in my role as a leader, until I can see someone else's value, until I can see their potential of what they could become, and recognize they're a lot more than that crime. And I don't even know what it what happened in their life to get them to that crime. But I know that they have potential to change and live a meaningful life. They will respond if you can see people that way. You know, yep. if you can see their worth, they will respond to what you have to say because they will feel seen and heard and cared for. And I know it's hard with corrections because they teach boundaries and you can't be taken advantage of it. You know, I get it. It's such a hard line to walk, but If you can keep the boundary and also recognize someone's worth, you can still say no and recognize their worth. You can still say no because I care about you enough that, you know, no, I care about myself enough. The officers I worked with in Minnesota, Wasika, all the time they said no. You know, hey, I need a bulletin board. No, we don't do that. Okay. But I still knew I was cared for. That was just them holding their own boundary. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like I was really fortunate. There, there's good and bad examples, but I chose to focus on the good because it makes me a lot happier to just look at the good things. But there are things that could change. I think the people that exemplify the good should, you know, continue doing that and train the ones that aren't. <laughs> <laughs> we may have tiptoed into my next question, but I was going to ask the follow up. Many of our listeners do, in fact, work in the field of probation and parole and, and, and corrections. What piece of advice would you give to those practitioners? Well, one thing I know about myself is I did the work. And if you, you, you know, if you're in probation, do the work with yourself. <laughs> you know, I'm not really going to be able to support others unless I'm, I'm walking the line. And so that was something I noticed Um with whether it's officers or probation officers, COs or probation, it seems that the ones that had their own house in order, so to speak, like they weren't, they weren't tricking things up in their own life. Like they had it together themselves. They're going to be able to hold the line with you, you know, and, and be effective. And so, I mean, I just, I think the advice goes to anyone in any field, which is just make sure your own house is in order you know, if you're struggling with something, acknowledge it because until you can, you can't really expect someone else to do that. And it, it may not be criminal, but whether it's, you know, whatever it is, if you're teaching cognitive behavioral therapy, you better be able to do the work yourself in your own life, you know, because that's how, that's the respect that comes from anyone. And there's no way to trick that up. So. I just love that advice. I just love that. Let me ask you this from your lens. What is one thing that the public gets wrong about justice involved individuals who are, who are tempted to reintegrate back into their communities? I think that, I mean, that is my passion is to write about the human side of people that go through this process in terms of employers. I think they get it wrong all the time because the people that I met in prison, so many of them, they're grateful, they're hardworking. The guys in the halfway house were working two jobs. You know, they're willing to prove themselves. If I was hiring, I would say, I'd rather have someone justice involved. I know exactly what they've done and where they're at. I hire someone else. I don't know all the things that they've got in the bag, but I know what this person's dealing with, whether I have to drug test them, whether it's an honesty thing, and we have to have straightforward conversations you know, so I think that maybe not recognizing the strengths of people who are incarcerated 
or have been or through the system. The other thing is just the strength that it takes to overcome the hard lives they have are assets for them to move forward, you know, and the humanity of people. I mean, these are humankind. They sacrifice a lot to support me. And I had the best circumstances. I had supported family and community. So I just was so surprised that all I saw on TV or heard in the news is the bad stuff about people. I'm like, that's not what I experienced at all. When you mentioned the the stigma around uh, employment with folks who have criminal histories, you reminded me of something that I heard once from Professor John Loeb, who te- he's a criminologist who teaches at Harvard, actually, and he's talked about the fact that criminal history is a great predictor of, of future behavior, but what people don't realize is that predictive validity decays rather rapidly. So the research shows that it's really only predictive within, I want to say, three to five years, and then it, then it's no longer a valid predictor. So the the question that employers should be asking isn't, do you have a criminal conviction, but rather, how long ago has it been that you've been crime-free? Because, and I can yeah. use extremes to illustrate this, but somebody who, 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 who offended in their teens or early 20s, by the time they're 30 years old, then that shouldn't even be considered. It's no longer a valid predictor of, of recidivism. Right. But there's such, as you've noted, such stigma and bias a- around that that we're just so hung up on that. Definitely. I think that needs to change. And that is a big part of my passion and my purpose is to talk about the human side. And I think we do that through stories. And that is a big reason I wrote the book that I did and I blog and I write about it on, on social media is people don't care until they know the human side, you know? So I share human stories and then we talk about the principles of change. Exactly. Well, I'm looking forward to reviewing it myself. You are juggling so many things right now, Portia, but what's, what's on the horizon for Portia Lauder? When I have you back on the program (laughs) in the future, whether it's a year or three years or five years, look into your crystal ball, Portia. What do you think we'll be talking about? Goodness, I, you know what, everything has happened so fast for me. I have only been out of prison for three years. So, I mean, I am fresh. (laughs) (laughs) And already so many things has happened. I I expect that I will write another book. I speak a lot, at least a couple times a week. I am at different events speaking. I also, like I say, I want to continue the work that I do, advocacy work. I... This morning, I was working with a with a school of kids, troubled teens, you know, and I love that work, but I, there's only so much time, really only so much energy. I also have children and grandchildren, so I expect that some life is going to continue as it is, and I'm going to keep doing the things that I'm passionate about. I love sharing stories of humanity and, and talking about I, – I, I just don't think focusing on the problems, and I know it has to happen because, you know, there are people out there that have to analyze that but there's not enough people talking about the beauty of transformation that can take place in people's lives in the process of this. I just love how you said that. Uh, I'm going to leave your website, portialouder.com in the episode description, along with the Amazon link to your book. I know you're on LinkedIn as well. So I encourage my listeners to connect with Portia Louder to hear more about the great, amazing stuff she's up to. Portia Louder, I appreciate you being on the show so much and I look forward to our next visit. Thank you, Joe. You have a great afternoon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. A huge criminologist podcast. Thank you to Portia Lauder. Such a treat for us to have someone as genuine as Portia come on the show and share her expertise and experiences for others to learn from. As promised, I will leave a link to Portia's website, PortiaLouder.com, in the episode description of this program, along with information to secure her book, Living Louder, A Compassionate Journey Through Federal Prison. I encourage you to check both of those resources out. And speaking of resources, if you would like to be a resource for this show, simply click on the Become a Supporter link in the episode description, and that will provide you with details on how you may support the show financially. You can become a supporter of the program for as little as $3 per month 
or can save some money by opting to become a yearly supporter. Again, simply a way for you to show your appreciation for the show and help offset some of our overhead cost. Back next week with a fresh episode. In the meantime, you may contact the show or reach out to us through our website, the Paragon Group, LLC.com, for training or presentations as to core correctional skills, implementation, or of course, the topic of desistance from crime. If you have questions or comments as to this podcast, feel free to contact the show via our email at thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. That's thecriminologistpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to follow us through our Facebook and Instagram pages at The Criminologist Podcast. New fun images are being added all the time to those feeds. You don't want to miss out. The Criminologist Media Group is also on Twitter. You can give us a follow at Crim Media Group. That's C-R-I-M Media Group. You may also connect with me, Joseph Arvidson, or Portia Lauder on LinkedIn. And follow both the Criminologist Podcast and the Paragon Group on our LinkedIn pages. Hey, lastly, if you've not already done so, check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Criminologist, for additional content as to the themes of this podcast. Merchandise is now available. If you go to our website, you can click on the shop link and that will give you details on how you can secure criminologist coffee mugs, refrigerator magnets, or even pens for the officer home. And if you believe in what we're doing on the show, if you're part of the movement, please spread the word. Tell a friend or a coworker or a colleague about us. Ask them to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, do so yourself if you've not already done so. And always remember, folks, there's no them. There's only us. I found humanity there. And I was surprised because everything on TV says that people in prison are these crazy wild people. But I found connection, support. We, we really, I met a lot of amazing people that had the hardest lives. The Criminologist Podcast is a production of the Paragon Group, LLC. For speaking engagements, interviews, program design, or training opportunities, please visit us at theparagongroupllc.com. If you enjoyed the show, you can find more content and videos on our YouTube channel, The Criminologist. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Both The Criminologist Podcast and The Criminologist Channel are brought to you by The Criminologist Media Group. Be sure to give us a five-star review, and thanks for listening.